It was a dud. Should I redo it? Double ding since the first one was a dud. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Brentwood. We are going to start today with an invocation by Jody Rawl and then the pledge and four way test led by Steve Huff. If everyone could bow your heads, um, we do have a special prayer request. One of our new members, James Davis, uh, reached out to us and said that they're having a severe medical situation today. So if everybody would lift them up in prayer, and I think we've also had some prayer concerns um, listed. Bow our hearts and um, we beseech thee, our heavenly father, to bestow thy grace upon this meeting. As we enjoy our fellowship one with another, may we grow in stature so that we may be able to give more to our friends in Rotary and in turn give strength to the ideals of Rotary in the service to mankind. Amen. Please join me in the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which it stands, a nation indivisible. And now for the four-way test of things we think say and do first second third fourth plus one waiting on our fearless leader Wow. Yes, absolutely. And we are now ready for guests. Okay. Steve, you ready? So All now right. our club secretary is going to introduce guests and visiting Rotarians. All right, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We have a couple of visitors, and Roger Greenup has a lovely visitor today. I am delighted to have my wife, Shirley, with me today. Glad to have you, Shirley. And many of you may know Jerome Bannister. He's a Rotarian from the downtown Franklin Club. Everybody say hello, Jerome. Good to have you. And I think that's all we have for today. Back to you, Jane. Great. Um, so, Drew... We'll lead us in happy bucks now. Right on. Can everybody Ooh, hear me? Happy. All right. I get to start and I get a freebie because I don't have any cash um, and I don't know how to use PayPal. So um, first, I am happy because we are not going to be tallying the results of the foundation drive today, but I do have an update that I want to share with everybody because it's such great news. We will have closed out the foundation drive with a total collection of $69,520 across the BRCCF and Rubber Foundation. Thank you. Congratulations to each of you um, and the work that we do through the Rotary Foundation and BRCCF uh, speaks for itself. So thank you. Tom. It's been four long years, but last week, the forces of good prevailed over the forces of evil at last. Florida State Seminoles defeated the horrible Florida Gators, 45 to 38. It was a hell of a game, and Larry was texting me in the middle, saying, are you okay? Are you going to make it? 11 touchdowns and scored, but in the end, right prevailed, and the wrong failed. Yeah, I know. I'm screaming from it. It was wonderful. And I just want to say I really hate the Florida Gators. Who else is happy? Got to have them. Here we go. Deb. Just a quick note to say I'm happy today, uh, mostly because I'm thankful for all of you. Y'all have been very good to me over the last few weeks with notes, with emails, with texts. I really do appreciate it, and it means a lot, so keep it going. <laughs> Thank you, Devin, and best of luck to you. 
Okay, that's good. I like that too. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm very proud alumni of University of Florida, as is my husband. And win or lose, I will always be a loyal fan. I'm not fair weathered. But secondly, I want to say thank you to God because I had pneumonia um, before Thanksgiving. My children cooked Thanksgiving dinner for us, and it was such a blessing to me. So, nice. I'm happy because we have a servant in our presence who has agreed to run for the Brentwood City Commission. It's someone I've served with for many years on many different projects throughout this community. Um, you all all know Devin McClendon, and I'm thankful as a commissioner and someone who has served up there and knows the sacrifice it takes for 14 years that we have someone who's willing to put themselves out there and do that. I think all of you in the club, except maybe some of the newer members know Devin and the quality of the person he is. He's exactly what you want in a public servant, especially a local public servant. He's intelligent, he's hardworking, he has integrity, and most importantly, he has a servant's heart. Brentwood special elections are January 3rd, January 7th, early voting. You can vote at the administrative center down in Franklin starting on December 27th. And election day, a little bit unusual, is January 12th, which is on a Thursday. If you don't go out and vote and at least tell 10 people you know, and I know all of y'all have influence and a circle of friends, you need to tell at least 10 people, one, that this election is very important, and two, it's very easy to vote in Brentwood. So if you want good leadership, leadership that actually truly wants to serve what's the interest of the community, you need to, to go and vote on election day. And I'm thankful that my friend Devin McClendon is running for the Brentwood City Commission. Amen to that. Back to you, Bert. Pretty interesting timing on this. Uh, you have these happy things happen that make you uh, kind of glad you're a Rotarian, you know people. I had a flat tire in my truck the other day in the driveway. I, I don't know how to change the power on the truck. It's, it was under the truck. And I, you know, so I called AAA and they sent a guy out, really nice guy from Murfreesboro. And he's, we we're talking, good old boy. He's getting the tire out. He's fixing it. And uh, he says, well, I normally drive the tow truck. I don't, I don't do this very often. I said, well, cool, man. I said, so if I'd had to have this towed, what, what would you have done? And he said, well, I have to take it to Christian Brothers down here right down the street from me. I said, well, no, you would have taken mine to, to Ray Little. And he said, do you know him? And I said, yeah. He said, man, I've got to meet this guy. He said, you would not believe how many people I go to that say, hey, I'm going to Ray Little. That's the only place you can take my car. And I said, well, I'm not surprised. He said, well, he, he must be phenomenal. I don't even know him, but I'd love to meet him. And I said, okay. So you'd like to hear those kind of things. Thank you, Larry. Charles. I will pay. I'll teach you how to use PayPal later. You're really too young for that. Um, hey, I just wanted to thank everybody who came out uh, to the movie showing at my house on Tuesday. If you weren't able to make it, thank you for not coming because we had an overflow crowd and poor Jason Cook and his girlfriend who showed up last had to sit on beanbags on the floor. So had you come, you would have been just, I guess, just on the floor. Um, anyway, we had a great, we got a terrible raging case of COVID. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, so, uh, we had a great time. Thank you for all that came and I'm going to do another one in January. I won't, I won't send you all invitations again. You've, you've survived that, uh, but I may mention it in the club because so many people came up and had a good time. So we'll probably do it again in late January. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead. Wipe, wipe that off. <laughs> Who else? I know I've got Curry back here. I wanted to echo, echo what Ray Little said. Only about 1,200 1, people vote in these elections, and it behooves us all to be honorable enough to go out and vote, and Devin is a fine candidate. Completely agree. Oh, sorry, I missed you, Laura. Okay, I know it's not quite done yet, but after six and a half years under construction, it is like driving on carpet on Franklin Road right now. I'm just so excited. Thrill. Amen to that. Anyone else? I believe that's it, President Covington. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so now 
as we start our announcements, I want to share, I want to do showing show and tell first. These are some awards that our club received at the district meeting. We were the number two club in the district in per capita annual fund giving. The number one club was the uh, Columbia Breakfast Club that our district governor uh, is a member of. So we came in second. And as I understand it, they're smaller and they sometimes beat us, but we sometimes beat them. So anyway, still a good, uh, a good award for us to receive and maybe we'll beat them next year. Uh, let's see, we got, this one is 100% Foundation Giving Club. That's us, that is very impressive. Good job, everybody. And then this is the banner for every Rotarian every year, which means that everybody gives their $100 to the Rotary Foundation every year. So good job, club. We've got our, our banners here. And then the next thing, um, unfortunately, Jennifer Bourne is not here right now, but I did want to extend a very special thank you to Jennifer Bourne and to Sybil, because as a lot of y'all know, um, Sherry Koss's husband is very ill and Sherry was uh, planning our banquet that I was also not able to attend due to a family event, but um, but those two really stepped in at the last minute and had to do a lot more work than normal because of the venue change. So I have a thank you gift. I just gave Jennifer hers and I would like to give Sybil a thank you gift as well. Okay, uh, and then one more before I turn it over to a couple other folks for announcements. The first is I just wanted to remind everybody that we have these blankets and these are the club blankets that we give to people, to members who are ill. And we just remind them that when they use this blanket, they are covered in the club's love and prayers. And we've got three people that we need to send blankets out to, Leon Partain, Roger Reed and Bill McCarthy. And if anyone is able to deliver to any of, uh, of those three folks, please let us know. The blankets will be sitting up here on the head table. Uh, and let's see, Patrick, I think is going to harp on Harpeth River cleanup. <laughs> How do you follow that? Five million comedians out of work and our president has to be one. Um, no, uh, there's a reminder on your table very quickly. Little Harpeth, we're going to try to resurrect that after having to cancel it last year. 28th of January, um, everything's the same as it has been in previous years. This is our 18th annual cleanup. It should be out. The information should be out on our social, social media sites and pages. Um, please share this with the scouts. We've got a couple of groups that have already reached out to me. Thanks to Ted. Um, we've got some very bright Duke alum who are going to be uh, coming and joining us, about 10 or 15 of them. So we'll have uh, some really smart people on the river this year to go with people like me who have a very mediocre public education. Um, but if you have any questions, please direct folks to me. Um, if you have um, an interest in signing up, the two things I really need are people to lead sections of the river and folks there to help me herd cats on Saturday morning. Everything else I've gotten pretty much under control as far as the contacts go. So, and I uh, asked some folks to help me kind of get the word out on some of the other media pages that our folks tend to flock to. So anyway, um, also uh, it is the end of the second quarter of our Rotary fiscal year. So as your treasurer, um, keep Rotary in your Christmas and holiday plans. So as you're getting your checkbook out, if you owe us a little money, just go ahead and just fill one out for the club while you're at it. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And we do have um, quite a few thank you letters for uh, the gifts that our club has bestowed on other organizations to serve our community. We've got one from In Slavery. We have one from Owls Hill. We have one from the After Breast Cancer Program and one from Saddle Up. So some nice thank you notes for what we've done. And then we also have a certificate of appreciation um, for our support of the End Polio Now program. So, 
At this time, I am going to ask club. Oh, so we also just got some information that a former club member has passed away. If anybody knows uh, Rob Michaels, do y'all remember him? He runs that serve and protect. That's it. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Chaplain for the city of Brentwood. Anyway, that's sad news. Um, so I guess we'll look out for arrangements and share information if anyone finds it. And at this point, I'm going to ask club member Betsy Crossley to come up and introduce our very special guest speaker today. So this speaker today uh, is well known to me, and I can tell you they started their medical association uh, with uh, their association with medicine when they were 18 years old. And that's an awfully long time to be interested in taking care of people. That's what George does. Uh, he's the most compassionate physician I have ever met. And I think his patients feel pretty much that same way. Uh, he was trained at Medical College of Georgia and graduated from there, went on to UAB uh, to do his residency and fellowship. And uh, he was elected as chief fellow for his last year there, which is a wonderful honor. And I mean, as chief resident there, uh, which is a wonderful honor, went on to his fellowship and then got his first faculty appointment at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. And after that, we moved up to Nashville, where he went into private practice, since we had children getting ready to go to college, and you need to make a little bit more, more money than you do as academics, but uh, more importantly, a practice for 15 years here at Baptist um, and was really the administrative leader of the group for 15 years. Uh, then uh, finally, George has landed at a, a wonderful place, Vanderbilt University, where he's a full professor. So uh, he's gonna tell you a little bit about what he says he does as a, a country electrophysiologist, but uh, if you would uh, please welcome my best friend and sweet husband, George Crossley. I am not going to touch that microphone. I heard the noise it makes. Thank you for thank you for having me. I I, I really appreciate it. I, I love Rotary. I wish I could be part of Rotary. It, I, that there are no Rotary meetings that happen when I can be there. It's the the problem I have. I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about the crazy world of electrical cardiology. When you think about cardiology, most people think about blocked arteries and bad hearts and Thing, people who uh, put stents in and bypass and things like that. And our, our world's a little different. We, uh, we, we, we try to preach the, uh, the NES saying of li living better through electricity. Uh, if you're old enough to remember, that's what the electrical society used to call it. You know, the, the people that I described that take care of the rest of cardiology, we call plumbers, they call us electricians. Uh, we think they're sort of knuckle draggers they think we're propeller head geeks. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a lot like um, things that we have in the city. I'll show you that in a minute. What do plumbers do? They take care, they put stents in. This is a blocked up artery. You put a, put a wire in there with a little cage, you blow it up and then, uh, then the artery stays open. And then if you behave yourself and take your drugs long-term, you uh, may be able to keep that open. We've, our plumbers have done in the last, in the last 15 years have really developed things to an incredible degree and largely cardiology plumbers have taken smart ideas that surgeons do with knives and come up with ways to do it with wires and needles. And so, for example, here is a picture of how aortic valves are replaced now. I mean, 10 years ago, if you had to have your aortic valve replaced, you got you you got a full chest zipper and uh, you spent about six months recovering from it. Now you get a stick in your leg with a pretty big tool, but uh, no bigger than some of the things we use. And the valve gets deployed and, and within a few days, you're back to back to normal functioning. And th this valve lasts uh, a good long while. And uh, when it wears out, you can put another one inside it. And so uh, the, the advances are quite good. We've even branched out into fixing things that only surgeons did, such as uh, aortic aneurysms. This is a picture of a patient 
this is the aorta, which is the big blood vessel that comes out of your heart. And you can see there's this ballooned area. It looks like one of Ray Little's tires that he's fixing that's uh, blown out on the side. And that, that, that's a, a terrible problem and can lead to sudden death from that. And what our folks can do now is put, put stents in there, open it up there, put one down here and put one bridging it and uh, keep you again from having to have a surgery. The open chest surgery for this problem has almost a 30% rate of leaving you paralyzed. And this procedure has a quarter of 1% rate of leaving you paralyzed. So even the plumbers that we make for fun of with their knuckle dragging approach have a, have, a, uh, have a lot to contribute. As I said, the difference in the, in the unions with us is a lot like the city. The, it, it's a lot like the conflict between Chief Hickey and Chief Goss. The, the Chief, uh, Chief Goss thinks the police just spend their time at the donut shop and, uh, and Chief Hickey thinks that the, uh, pl that, the, that, that the firemen are pretty simple. We, we all know that none of that is true, but, uh, but it makes for good fun. So what am I gonna talk about here? I'm gonna talk about the things that we do. We, we spend a lot of time treating fast heart rhythms. Some of those are terrible, drop dead kind of heart rhythm problems that can lead to sudden death. And I'll show you some of the therapies we have for that. Most of them are pain in the backside kind of rhythms that make you feel bad or may do things to you long-term. And, and I'll show you some of the things we, we can do with that. We also treat slow heart rhythms. And we also have ways to make heart failure better. And heart failure is a terrible problem that can lead to your heart, your pumping chamber of your heart, ballooning out over time, similar to that blood vessel, and pumping less and less well and leaving you short of breath, your legs swelling and feeling bad long-term. And we, we have a lot of therapies for that now. We have a lot of great drug therapy for that. And I'm gonna show you an example of some electrical therapy. This is sort of the electrician's view of the heart. You know, we're, we, we don't think there's anything in the heart but the wiring system. And this is the upper chamber. This is the, the, the heart's conduction system, which is nowhere near that big. That's just that big so I can teach interns and residents about this. And what happens here is that the natural heartbeat comes from the right upper chamber. That's your natural pacemaker. Mm -hmm. That fires, makes the electricity come, come to, across the upper chamber and makes that contract. And then that electrical impulse gets into this, which is your natural wiring system. It delays just a little bit there and then fires down and makes the lower chambers contract. And what can happen in this is lots of different things. I'm gonna show you an example of, of the thing that I, that was sort of our first rhythm of having insightful new ways to, to take care of problems with catheters rather than, rather than surgery. It's a problem called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And what it is, is you've got a little extra connection out here. And that impulse, when it comes across here, it goes down this way and it can go down this way. And what it can do is go in circles as it is here. It can come down here, go up there and go round and around it at 200, 300 beats a minute. It can also get into atrial fibrillation and then create enormous havoc. Atrial fibrillation can create havoc in a normal heart but in a, in a patient who has one of these goofy connections, your heart can try to go four or 500 beats a minute. And it's one of the most common reasons for young people to have sudden death. Not that, young, not that sudden death is common in young people, it's not. But among sudden death in young people, this is third or fourth. Well, well behind um, drug use, which is the most common thing for sudden death in young people. And so what we, what we do with this is, <clears throat> What we, when, I, when, when I was a trainee, what we would do with this is do a catheter procedure and map where this connection was. It's not always where I drew it. It could be anywhere in the heart. And we would spend maybe seven, eight, nine hours mapping that and convincing ourselves exactly where it was. We would send the patient back to their room, let them recover. And the next day we would take them to the operating room. The surgeons would open their chest would find that part of the heart and cut it off the lower chamber and sew it back together and would, um, would cure this problem. What we do now is in about 30 minutes, because of some technology I'm gonna show you, we can map and know exactly where this is. And then we take however long it takes us to get a catheter 
right on top of that and zap it with electricity and get rid of it. And the patient goes home that afternoon and we don't let them do any squatting or lifting for a day or two. And by two days later, they're back to normal. So I'll show you, this is, oh my goodness, this isn't gonna play either, is it, Linus? Oh gosh. Would you click that and see if it'll play? I don't think it will. Not so much. Oh my God. Oh yeah, there you go, it is. So this is the way we map the heart. This shows you the electricity going across the heart. It's starting up here and comes down here where it should stop and it leaks across that little, that little gap there. That's that extra connection. Now we've got a catheter in the lower chamber and we pace down here and we see the electricity going backwards to the upper chamber. Again, we identify that little spot. We put this mapping catheter right on top of it and we, we can see the impulse from it. Here we compare the forward direction to the backward direction. And then I'm gonna show you putting a catheter on it right on top of it. And you can see funny rhythm, funny rhythm, normal rhythm right there. And in about three seconds, we get rid of this problem and and uh, and make it a, a, a it's not a covering it up, it's a curing it problem. And takes a young person from being impaired and not being able to exercise and not being able to do uh, do normal living and also having heart rates that are 300 beats a minute and converts it into uh, a normal a normal heart. Th this is um, this is what I grew up doing. We do it less now because truthfully, most people that have this problem get identified as a, as a in the pediatric literature in the pediatric period and get taken care of before they get to be adults. <clears throat> so this is the way we look at the heart. I'm gonna show you some other stuff. Uh, this is the, the right atrium, the right upper chamber. This is the left atrium behind these these two valves is a little wall between them. And um, I'm gonna show you about atrial fibrillation in just a second. Um, and what we do with that is we take a catheter and put it in the leg, pass it up to the heart. We find this little narrowed area that's right up in here with an ultrasound device that's either in the blood vessels or down the throat. We can see it and scoot a little tiny needle across into the left atrium. And then we put the catheter over into that. And this is the way we look at it. This is the left side of the heart. And this is the part where atrial fibrillation comes from. Atrial fibrillation, you've all heard of, I bet, because you I, I bet everybody in the room has a friend who's had atrial fibrillation. Atrial fib is by far the most common heart rhythm problem in anybody older than 50. It gets really common in your 60s. It gets incredibly common in your 70s. It gets to be about 20 to 25% of people by the time in your, you're, in, you're in your 80s. And um, it can cause strokes. It causes about 40% of strokes in this country. Uh, it causes heart failure long-term. And just the presence of atrial fib over time creates more atrial fibrillation and makes it a downhill course. So our therapies for this long-term were drug therapies. And... The truth of it is all of our heart rhythm drugs are poisons that we try to titrate in to the right amount of the poison to do good and not do harm. And, and that's not the easiest thing in the world and not the most reliable thing in the world. And we've had ways to treat atrial fibrillation with surgery called a maze operation for years. It's, the, it's a bigger heart operation than a, than a, than a bypass operation though. I mean, and it, it takes easily six months to get over an open chest maze. Um, and so again, in the, in the repeated theme of cardiologists with wires uh, doing smart things that surgeons with knives have done, we've created a way that we can go in here and get rid of the atrial fibrillation because the AFib comes from these little veins. This is heart here and that's vein there. And there's a little bit of heart that goes down the lining of the vein and the AFib comes from that area. And so what we do is we put this catheter across the heart and we map where it's coming from. We look at the electrical impulses coming from each one of those veins. This is a, another view with the right side of the heart there and the left side of the heart there. 
and those four veins here, there, there, and there. And this shows you a mapping catheter in there and shows you um, how, we, uh, how we determine where it's coming from. This shows you the old, the way we, we still sometimes do afib ablation. We usually don't, but we, this is a, a, a loop catheter that goes around that vein and we see where the impulses are coming from the vein out into the heart. And then this is a, a, a zapping catheter, if you will, an electrical catheter that lets us put radio frequency energy on there and zap the spots where it's coming from and make it so those don't come out. We also have a better way to do it, which is using a, 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 a balloon catheter that gives us a whole, a more reliable block of the electrical impulses there. We, we, we put this catheter into the heart, we put it in the vein, we blow it up, and we put nitrous oxide in it, which is about minus 60, minus 65, and freeze the heart tissue around there. And this makes for a very, very reliable uh, way to get, to get rid of atrial fibrillation. We've also developed a brand new way, that, which we've done um, in a couple of clinical trials at Vanderbilt, and it'll be released um, in a year, year and a half. Um, there are four different manufacturers chasing it. Uh, the first one will be to market in about a year, year and a half, called pulse field ablation where it's a catheter that looks a bit like that and it goes up into the vein and just gives four or five pulses and wipes out the whole vein. And the good thing about it is we can tune that energy so it only ablates the heart. Part of the problem with any of this is there's stuff behind that. You know, what, what, what lives right up behind here is the nerve going to your breathing muscle, uh, your bronchi, your breathing tubes, and, and your esophagus is right behind there as well. And with any of, with the current burning technology or this freezing technology, <clears throat> we can do damage to some of those things. We do a thousand things to keep that from happening. But uh, with the new pulse field ablation, it's gonna turn it into um, a, a very easy thing to do. I, our results so far have been just astounding where we, we can, ablate the whole, the, all the cardiac tissue we want to and not have any heating in the esophagus or cooling or heating in the, in the bronchi. So the message from all that is a, AFib is a, is a really common problem. It's getting more common because the good news is we're all living longer. It, you know, when, um, how, did we, how did we get to the retirement age at 65? Most people didn't live that long. In 1964, when 65 was the retirement age, the average man in this country lived to be 67. That, that's a wake up for this 67 year old. So, so um, uh, and, and as, at na as now, most of us are living into our 70s. Many people are living into our 80s. Betsy's father just turned 100. Um, it, it, the AFib is becoming very common, and the good news is we've got good, good things to do about it. This shows the way we look at that when we map that. Uh, this is another look at the heart when uh, this is that left atrium there, and there, those are the veins there, 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 and there. And this is what it looks like. That's what it looked like when the patient came on the table to me. The purple is normal, to, is, is, is is contracting tissue, electrically normal tissue. The sort of spotty looking nasty stuff is where AFib frequently comes from because it, there are little scars there and, it, and the AFib conducts in, in loops. And so this patient, it, this is what it looked like at baseline. This is after I took my freezing balloon and froze here, there, there, and there. And you can say we have this Beautiful University of Georgia red color there. In, in all four veins and a nice smooth line there that would never create heart rhythm problems. And this is, this is exactly how we, how we do all that. So what else do we, uh, what, el what else do electrical cardiologists do? Slow heart rhythms back years ago were some of the most common deadly heart rhythm problems. And, uh, um, that we knew of, that we could do anything about. And, um, and the slow heart rhythm problems 
can commonly be in the upper chamber as they are in older people, or in some people, you have problems in that conduction system. Remember the spider looking thing I showed you? Sometimes there's, there's scar or uh, blockage in that area. You've got a heart attack, a microscopic heart attack that knocks off that and it leaves the upper chamber beating on its own and the lower chamber down here sort of ignoring it and beating it 10 or 15 beats a minute. And so the treatment for that's a pacemaker now. The journey to pacemakers were was was, was interesting. I mean, the this guy gets very little credit for uh, pacemakers, but in 1932 he created six units uh, as he was working with Siemens. This is what the pacemaker looked like, mind you, and and it had to be hand cranked to work. Uh, so it it was not a uh, it was not a durable therapy. But he certainly proved that he could use electrical stimulation to make the heartbeat. Uh, it took a long time for that to, um, to, to come to be. This was his first uh, device that he made that he tried to get people to actually use. And that, that never really uh, came to be. Paul Zoll was the first guy to actually bring this to a patient. And this is the first patient in this country, uh, or the first patient in the world, actually, to ever get a pacemaker. He had a heart block, he had a heart rate on his own of about 20 beats a minute. And he has a, a pacemaker that goes in through his neck and it's connected to this giant box there that's got vacuum tubes in it and uh, circuits that are very foreign to what we think of now. And it had to be wheeled around, uh, wheeled around on, that, uh, on that. Over time, pacemakers became very easy to put in. And, and I, I'll show you here, this is a photo. This is an, an X-ray of a patient with a pacemaker. That's a typical pacemaker put in the left chest. This is the this is the right lung. This is the left lung. These wires go through your blood vessels down into the heart. This one goes into the upper chamber, and this one goes into the lower chamber. And it can do anything it needs to. It, this may pace the upper chamber and let it conduct to the lower chamber. It may sense the upper chamber and then. Uh, and then look for an impulse in the lower chamber and not see it, and therefore pace in the lower chamber. If your heart's in normal rhythm, it sits and watches. So they're relatively smart, and they have been for a while. Um, and they've come a long way. And I'm going to show you some, I've got some things to pass around in a few minutes. I think I'm going to go through this first, and then I'll show you the, uh, show you the goodies. I think you'll like that. We also do things called defibrillators, which are boxes that do everything a pacemaker does, but also have the ability to resuscitate you if you get into a dying kind of heart rhythm. If you have heart failure and your heart pump function is low, is down, we, we use a number called ejection fraction, which compares the heart when it's full to the heart when it's empty. And if that number is 35% or less, and you've been on good medical therapy for a while, you've got significant risk of having a disastrous drop dead fast heart rhythm problem. And what this, what this box does, in addition to functioning as a pacemaker, if you get into a drop dead kind of heart rhythm problem, it can either use a rapid pacemaker function to get you out of it, or it can deliver a shock to you just like a paramedic would. And the shock goes from that can to that thick part of the wire right there. That thick part of the wire is a is a is a coil that's in the that's in the heart. So we've come a long way with pacemakers, and and my, I've spent most of my career uh, developing new ways to do pacing, new wires, and new pacemakers. I'm going to show you a, a couple of things in just a minute that I think you'll uh, that I think you'll be impressed with. Let me just do that right now. I'm going to pass these things around, but th th this is the only wire I have that doesn't have a screw on it. So I'm not going to pass around a sharp object and let somebody get cut. But the, the, the wires can either have screws or little prongs that hold them in place. And this is typical of, um, of what pacemaker wires look like. This is the first pacemaker that was really designed to go up here in the chest and be uh, be implanted. It was it was it was from the early 70s. It, the can the the box is made of epoxy, and it's got NiCad batteries in it. Anybody know why that's a problem? What do NiCad batteries do? 
What? They, well, they can catch on fire. They, one of the things they do is blow up. They, they, they expel gas. And so uh, the, the gas would actually collect in the pocket where each of these NICAT batteries were, and it, it didn't end well. That, that, was, uh, that, that was the short, short uh, of it. Then, then we developed lithium batteries, and this is what the first lithium pacemaker looked like. It, look, it looks like a hockey puck, right? Well, that moving through life, this is what a standard pacemaker looks like now. The, the, and this, that not first lithium battery would last about four years. This will last about 14 to 16 years, depending on how much it's, uh, how much it's used. Because <laughs> you use it too much. <laughs> so moving on to that, We've got what we've, what we've worked on, and I, I started working on in the early, in 2006, and was finally uh, uh, implanted in the first human in about 2012. And this is uh, called a micro pacemaker. This is the pacemaker. It goes in through a tube in your leg, goes into your heart like this. Here, go ahead. Goes in, goes in. It, mind you, it's a pretty big tube. You, you don't want to be fully awake when we put this in, and we wouldn't do that. Uh, it goes in through the tube coming up to your leg, goes through the heart valve, and gets implanted in your heart right there. It, and the little prongs that you see on it hold it in place. How long do you think this will last? Uh, not 20 years, but 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 often in the 12 to 16 year range, depending on how much it's pacing. It, it uses a, an incredible array of technology. One, one of the best stories in this is in the, <clears throat> I was a, one of the medical advisors to the development team. And, and there was this whole array of engineers at Medtronic. I mean, very senior people who had been there since God came and said pacemakers will come from Minnesota. And, uh, and, and down to engineering interns. And we're in a meeting one day and they're, they're looking at 22 different designs for how the tip electrode, the little black thing on the tip is gonna be handled and how this thing will deliver energy. And this engineering, this, it, none of those were this design. And this engineering intern said, you know, guys, you've got the world's best electrode on the wire. That wire that I passed around has an electrode on it that works incredibly well. He says, why don't you just take that electrode and put it on there? instead of making a new electrode. And everybody says, oh, blah, 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 blah. and then the, one of the senior people uh, sort of sat there and looked puzzled. And then by six months from there, that's what they had. And so this is, a, this is an electrode that's been around since the 90s. The, the intern did, yeah. She, she, she is now a very senior person at, at Medtronic. She, she got her, her, her career got rocketed with that. Okay, so this is, this is one of the most fun things. I mean, we can take somebody who shows up in the emergency room with heart block, a disastrous problem that we typically would have put a temporary pacemaker in and then scheduled a pacemaker in a few days and done all this. We can bring you up to where we work and within 15 minutes have this in you and have you home two hours later. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really great technology. This is the that that's the size of it for for those of you that haven't gotten your hands on it yet. So so you the any given heart could hold about four of these the, in its current design. There's lots of new stuff coming. Yeah, I mean, most of it I I can't even talk about. But um, so by the time these need to be replaced, we probably won't be replacing it with this exact technology. Uh, but any given heart could hold about four. The average age of a pacemaker patient in this country is 82. So um, it, it, the micro is a great option for a lot of people. Oh, it costs a lot. <laughs> well, what gets, what gets that, that, you know, medical cost is a stupid thing. It's a stupid thing because of, uh, because of federal rules that, that uh, make the hospital charge this theoretical retail price. 
that nobody pays except those of us that have high high deductible insurance. And it, it's a it's a really crazy thing. What typically gets paid for this for the procedure and the device is about twenty thousand dollars. And um, and I mean, yeah. Try one more time and see if this will play. Okay, dang it. So I said the other thing we treat is um, is heart failure. And, and this to me is the most magical thing that we do it, because this, we, we can take people who have heart failure from certain reasons and they will come in our EP lab looking blue as a pair of dungarees and leave pink. Um, my, one, of my, one of my happiest moments is when uh, uh, the wife of one of my patients um, was at her husband's bedside after I'd put this device in and she ran across the holding room and almost tackled me and shook me and said, you don't understand, he's infected. He hasn't been pink in 15 years. So, um, and, and, uh, and he, uh, he had the kind of response I'm going to tell you about. So what happens if you have what's called left bundle branch block, which is a common problem that happens in anybody with heart failure and it can happen in people with, uh, heart, with coronary disease too, is the heart contracts in a herky-jerky way. And what that picture was supposed to show you is the heart, a normal heart is like this and all the walls move at the same time and the heart contracts and twists just a little bit. So it's sort of like this and the blood squirts out here. And, and if you have this bundle branch block, not bundle branch block, this wall is and it takes a long time to get the electricity around the coverage of the heart. If this wall contracts, this wall falls down. And then finally, when the electricity gets out here, this wall contracts, and now this wall is flat, and it falls. Every heart rate is flush, 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 flush. And people can get into terrible heart failure with that. And so what, what we do, is we put one wire over here on the right side of the heart and one wire on the left side of the heart and make the two contract at the right time. We used to make them contract at the same time. We can program it now so it, we can tailor it and make it better for, for anybody. And you can, for people with a true left bundle branch block, half of our patients get two classes of heart failure better. And two classes of heart failure takes you from class three, which means I couldn't walk from here to the door without stopping and breathing hard and holding on for a little while to being asymptomatic. So it's, it's a truly wonderful thing to be able to take somebody with terrible quality of life and, and give them that. Now, I've spent much of the last 15, 20 years working on these crazy wires. I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. This is the little bitty wire that goes in the vein out there. We used to just have one electrode on it. And so we had to find the right vein with something that would capture. And now this one has four electrodes on it. You can see one there, one there, one there, and one there. And so we can pace on any of those electrodes. And then I'm gonna show you one that's even better than that, that has four electrodes on it and a screw that holds it in place. So we, our, our initial foray into this was designing these three leads that come in different shapes for different veins. So either a, a, a canted one, we call it there, a straight one, which had some uh, little barbs on it at times, those are very soft. And then this S-shaped one for a, for a big old vein to, to help hold it in place. What we found is we still had even though we could get those in place, there was a not insignificant rate of those things slipping back over time and moving to a different place before they found their permanent home. And so we developed this wire, which has this little screw right there, which looks big here. It looks dangerous, but it's a tiny little thing. And we put it in, we can put it anywhere in the vein we want, down toward the tip of the heart, up toward the, the the, the transition from the upper chamber to the lower chamber, and we screw it in place with this, with this thing and holds it in place. And the, the, the likelihood uh, of that dislodging is down under 
where with all the other leads out there, the likelihood of it moving and getting to a little different place is in the 15% range. So that, that's what it looks like. Now, the funny story is they asked me to lead this project and lead the clinical uh, um, uh, design of getting, you know, testing this lead. And the engineer showed me this. And I said, there is no way in hell I'm going to put that in a human being and poke a hole in their heart. And uh, it shows you just how crazy big, big engineering designs are, because this is the, the distance between that and that is about a quarter of a millimeter. And it's not like it's going to get outside the heart and poke into something. And as soon as they took me into a, a, a lab and let me play with it and showed me how it worked, I, 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 would, I was hooked. And it's been an, it's been an interesting uh, endeavor since. So there was an old version of this that held in place by a different mechanism that worked really, really well. But it was really, really hard to take the thing out if it ever had to come out. Now, these wires don't often have to come out. But if you get infected later, I mean, uh, the, the most common time for an infection in a pacemaker or defibrillator is when you have your second replacement or your third replacement or you get pneumonia after one of those and then it gets infected. So the other one was really hard to come out. So this one is engineered so you can just pull it and it comes out. This is what it looks like in its native state. And this is what it looks like after two pounds of tug on it. Oh, only two pounds of tug. And it straightens out and helps you get it out. So it, it, it's been an interesting, it's been a good endeavor. The, this, is, this is how we put it in. This is a, a, a tube that goes into the vein on the back of the heart. This is the big vein on the back of the heart. And this is a huge vein out there. With the normal leads, you would have to put that tip way out here, which is not a great place to put it. You would, you would love it to be right up here. And with that active fixation, with that one with a screw on it, I can put it anywhere between there and there. And it really helps that. This shows you, maybe, will that play? My movies are not cooperating. Yep, this is important. Yeah. This shows us remove, no, I thought I got play. It was, oh yeah, there you go. It shows us how we can put about two pounds of force on it and, and, oh, it pops, pops loose and uh, we can put it, we, we can put a new, uh, a new device in. Oops, can you go to the next slide? It's there, we go. And this shows you an example of, of this in place. That's the shocking wire, the defibrillator wire. And this is the wire on the left side of the heart. It looks like they're right next to each other. When we look at it from the side, we can see that that's where we would pace from, from that shocking wire and where we pace from this wire is way back here on the back of the heart. So this is, is able to resynchronize the heart and make it, uh, make it do much better. That's just another example of that. So the last thing I wanna show you about is an exciting project that I started on 15 years ago <clears throat> that looked at pacemaker and defibrillator leads failing. There, I mean, in any, anything man makes is gonna fail at some time. Um, and, and we had especially a couple of new defibrillator leads, one with Medtronic and one with a company called St. Jude that had really unacceptably high failure rates. And, and the engineering that went into it was, didn't, there was, there, there was no prediction of that until we saw it failing in people. And so we, we looked at that and created, we, we spent about three years studying it, trying to figure out what created it. We created this model where we take patients with pacemakers and defibrillators and we three-dimensionally image them as the heart is beating, and then here as you're moving your arm, and look at the bending and stress on those leads. This is when your arm's down by your side. Uh, this is when it when you raise your arm up up in the air, and you you can see here in this other view, looking from the left side, it looks like a small a smooth bend there, and as soon as you lift your arm up over your head, you get this kink in it that would make any of us gasp. The truth of it is, the honest truth of it is, nobody ever thought about these leads outside the heart. 
all the studying of it in the past had been done of what happens in the heart, because that's what we're interested in, right? Well, it turns out where we put them underneath the can and with your arm moving does a lot of wacky things. And with this, we were able to construct a lab that where we, where we create these, af after imaging people doing all sorts of normal activities, we were able to reproduce those bins in the lab. And with every lead model that's been produced in the past, we were able to predict failure rates and time to failure based on that metal fatigue. And it, it's in, um, th this is a picture of it here. It's in, the lead is put on this machine here. The machine vibrates like that at a, you know, it, it, a million cycles in a day and eventually the metal fails. And with this, we're able to create uh, failure models so we know far ahead of time when things are when things are gonna fail. I mean, in the past, a lot of medical devices like heart valves, I mean, we don't really have a failure mechanism. We don't have a way to study heart valves like this. So we don't really know with heart valves that are new designs, how well they're gonna last in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And that's what we need them to do. The same was true for defibrillator leads. And uh, this has given us a, a marvelous way to do this. And it's created a new design that is, uh, that is probably gonna revolutionize things. One last thing before I go, still on the AFib um, uh, realm. This is a picture of, again of the left side of the heart. And this is a sac on the left side of the heart called the left atrial appendage. And it's the culprit for strokes. What happens when the heart's not beating, when it's just quivering like this, is that little sac can form little clots in it. And those clots can break loose and go to your, go to the, go to your brain or go to your heart or go wherever. It can go to your knee. And uh, if it goes to your brain, you get a stroke. And the brain is incredibly sensitive to that. And it doesn't take much to get you in trouble. The traditional approach to that is put you on strong blood thinners. And blood, we have blood thinners that work really well, but blood thinners make bleeding worse. You know, blood, blood thinners don't make you bleed. They don't create bleeding, but they make any bleeding that you have worse because you don't clot. And so in people that don't tolerate blood thinners, we can put this device in the left atrium that seals it off and lets the whole sack just sort of go away and your body forms a scar over this and when it's done it looks smooth as a baby's butt this is what it looks like to start with after a few weeks it looks like this after several months it looks like this and can get people off blood thinners if they're on blood thinners for AFib. now right certainly right now that's the indication for this is people who don't tolerate blood thinners um the the company that makes this has been very great. You've probably all seen ads for the Watchman device, uh, if not on if not on television on Facebook. And so we have a lot of patients who say, "I'm a, I'm on warfarin or I'm on Xarelto, and I, I want to get off it. I want to get this device." And that's not really the indication for it now. It's relatively expensive, and insurance only pays for it if you uh, if you have some uh, contraindication. Let me show you one other thing. I did. We talked about the defibrillators. When I started, this is what defibrillators looked like. And they lasted about three years. Had to be re-operated re on. They went in the belly. We tunneled, initially they went in the belly and the chest got opened and two flyswatter looking things went on the outside of the heart. By the time I got out of training in the, in the early nineties, we would tunnel wires up to here, tunnel them across here and down into the heart. And, uh, and they worked, but they were big surgery and they didn't last very long. This is what they look like now. And this will last um, average of about 12 to 16 years. This again was, depending on which one you had, anywhere from three to four years. So that's all I had. I'll be glad to answer any questions.
when we're trying to get rid of those tissues that cause fast heart rhythms, then we're looking at those electroanatomic things, that colored map is the way we map the electrical activation. We, we have probably 40 other images up there. We have x-ray images and we have electrograms from each one of those little things. I'm looking at a live screen that's got 64 channels going 200 beats a minute, looking at x-ray and listening to the sound, looking at the electroanatomic event. That's why you have to be just a little bit crazy to be an electrophysiologist. Yeah. Yeah. We've been doing that since the 90s. So for, for diet, but not for the stuff we do. That's that's to get in your arteries. You can go through the risk. For all these electrical things, we still have to go through. Yeah. George, are there... Uh... Okay. Sorry. Hey, George. Are there uh, two or three supplements that you're a fan of? Dietary supplements, omega-3s, curcumin, anything like that? But it depends your on what your, what, what your, what, 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 what your problem is. There, I mean, there's a lot of dietary supplements that are good at making money. There's some dietary supplements that, that, do, that do well. You know, we spent close to a billion dollars doing a study at Vanderbilt on fish oil. Found a pretty positive effect on lipids and none of the other things we looked at. We thought it was going to have a positive effect on AFib. Um, uh, a lot of cardiologists will recommend CoQ10 if you're on statins because it depletes it a little bit and it may, it may help, it may not. We don't really have any, any proof uh, of that. Um, I, I think that's a question for any given patient with their doctor. Uh, George, thank you for sharing today. Sure. Now that we all have these smart watches that have keep track of watch and keep track of heartbeats and things like that, how has, has that affected your world? Oh my God, yes. So. So in a good way and in a bad way. I mean, some of the some of it's over information. Some of them are better than others. So the Apple Watch in particular has a pretty darn good way to sort out if you're an AFib or not. It's not perfect, but it has a fantastic way to, to create an EKG and send it to you. So uh, there's there's good things and bad things, and there's going to be tons of that coming at us because. It's been identified by the corporate world as the way to make money off that. I mean, there's probably a hundred new devices that we're going to see over the next year. All, all expecting you to pay for it, not your credit card. Do you have an opinion about using a prescription statin versus some of these natural cholesterol lowering drugs like red yeast rice and there's several others that seem to so work. so we even have some randomized control trials for red yeast rice and other things now and and some of them show a small benefit none of them show a big benefit i mean the the the, the truth of it is we've got better data i know people are resistant to taking statin if you're healthy if you're otherwise healthy and you hadn't had a heart attack we've I mean, got a heart attack i don't think any sane person doesn't want to take their statin you, you don't want to have another heart attack. but <clears throat> If you if you if we're just trying to prevent the first episode of coronary disease, people are resistant to it; they don't want to take it, and there are some side effects from it that it can give you muscle aches and things that can be very bothersome to some to some people. But the the the, the true science of showing what it does is incredible. I mean, it's it's some of the best science we have in medicine to show a reduction in your in your blockage in your arteries over time and in your cholesterol. So there's survival benefit from all of the marketed statins. None of the uh, uh, sort of natural remedies to try to work on that have ever shown anything that looks like even in a bigger study that you would create something of significant. So a stat will actually reverse build up in your arteries or well, once it's there, there it's there's, there? I mean, the, our, our goal is to stop it and keep it from getting worse. Um, the truth of it is, if you get really aggressive about it and you get to the Dean Ornish level, which Dean, Dean Ornish diet is a, is a diet that's nothing meat. I mean, all tofu kind of protein, 
and lots of other stuff, and lots of exercise and the drugs. If you get to that, there is evidence that you can reverse. It. Once it gets to the calcified state, you can't really reverse it. If it, if it gets to hard calcium, it, the, the plaque goes from being a soft plaque to being a lightly calcified plaque, to being a heavily calcified plaque. When it gets to a heavily calcified plaque, you're not gonna reverse that at all. But the others, you can reverse it then. Well, the, the, so the best advice from our nutritionists and our weight loss people at Vanderbilt is it's good to eat fruits and vegetables and you ought to eat fruits and vegetables. Not, I mean, I, you, know, you can eat them however you want to eat them. If you want to pay somebody to freeze dry them and grind them up, give them to you, you can do that. And it, it's probably good for you, but it's probably a lot cheaper and more fun to eat, to eat, some, uh, eat some carrots and raspberries than it is to take a fistful of pills. That's the advice from, I'm not the expert in that. That's the advice from our, right? Being a mechanic, both an electrician and a plumber at times, some cars, I'm holding these leaves in my hand. So my brain went to, um, have you all thought about the electrode portion of it where the charge actually goes being wireless? Well, that's what, that's what that thing is. is the, I mean, it's, yeah, that, it's right. That's, okay. what, that's called they the micro. Are. There, there, are no wire, there are no wires in that. Okay. That's an electrode hooked straight up to the circuit board. Okay. The instance of the four and I forget what the sickness was, that, that got me thinking and then I told this lead I was going to go from the unit to that. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right, right? And, and in pacemakers and defibrillators, the leads have been on, have always been our weakest, our weakest link. What we do have now that I alluded to is, is a new technology of wire. That, that, those wires and all the previous wires have a coil down the middle, the insulator around it, a coil outside the insulator, and another insulator outside that. And if you take that, creates metal fatigue and creates failure. What we have now is a central core conductor. It's made of 64 filers of, um, of a, of a silver-based uh, silver uh, alloy that is incredibly flexible and isn't wound. And, uh, and it is as close to infatigable as you can get. I mean, we can run it on, on our failure machines out to 50 years and not see failure. The only failure machines we've seen on that are ones where there was some metal inclusion, some carbon trash in the wire, which in that kind of wire with the silver alloy rarely happens. And that wire happens in quarter of 1%. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, George. As a gift for speaking to our club, we've got a pen with our logo oh, on thank it. You. We will ask that you autograph this book that we read to first graders. And when we read the book to them, we'll tell them about your talk to our club. Um, also, Waverly tomorrow, we've got, uh, we've got about 20 club members heading to Waverly tomorrow. If you are not riding on the magic bus tomorrow to Waverly. I've got a rotary Santa hat for you. You can pick it up from, from me uh, here before you leave. If you are riding on the bus, then I'll hand the hats out on the bus. Something else? Two, room for two more folks on the bus. If anybody would like to last minute sign up, it's gonna be awesome. Um, 5.30 at the uh, Brentwood Library is when and where the buses will meet in the morning. Uh, and then also just one last reminder, if you are able to deliver a blanket to Leon Partain, Roger Reed, or Bill McCarthy, please grab it from the head table. We would love for these to be delivered by actual Rotarians instead of sending them. Uh-huh.
Oh, that's good. That is what we meant for them to be. Great. Thank you, Larry. And that's it. I think, is there anything else for the good of Rotary? If not, we're adjourned. Oh, hold on. Yes, next week is the annual assembly. So please show up. Here we go.